welcome back to another episode of Dr. Me First. It's me, your colleague in medicine, coach in life, queen of burnout, throwing in a little sass there, Dr. freaking Aaron Wiseman. I got to practice what I preach. I'm a recovering workaholic and rest is my detox. <laughs> so my team is pushing me to try to do more rest. I have really been invigorated since I got my new office and my podcasting equipment set up back full time. It's been so fun to be podcasting again and doing live episodes. But they're reminding me too that I'm overworking. So we are problem solving this. And in order to do that, we are doing a reboot showcase. All my work that I've done in the past, I might as well reuse it, right? Recycle, reduce, reuse. And so what we're going to do in this reboot showcase is take old podcast episodes that I've actually been on for other people and play them here on Dr. Me First. It makes me smile a little bit as I go back and listen to years ago when I was doing some of these podcasts and I'm like, wow, I was really smart. I knew a whole lot of things, but I also see how I've changed and how things are different. <laughs> In the world of Aaron Wiseman, we call it, is it long-haired Aaron or short-haired Aaron? Because <laughs> you can definitely see a big change when the hair got lopped off during the pandemic. So listen to the episodes and then see if you can tell when I did that episode on the timeline of everything Aaron Wiseman. Long-haired Aaron, short-haired Aaron. Give me an email. I'd love to hear about it. I'm going to take my own medicine, I'm going to rest a little bit, and I'm still going to pop up episodes for you to listen to. So enjoy this reboot today. And as always, friend, remember, your life, your calling, your pulse absolutely matters. And the badass in me honors the freaking badass in you. Enjoy! Welcome to the Power of the Purse podcast, the only show that inspires baby boomer women to gain confidence around money so they can navigate life powerfully on their own. Here's your host, Lynn S. Evans, certified financial planner. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lynn S. Evans, and I am the host of Power of the Purse podcast. There was a time in my life not too long ago when I believed three things about money. One, women are not supposed to talk about or be included in any conversations about money. Two, women don't have the natural ability to understand anything about money. And three, men know best how to manage money. And those truths I made up about money guided me for years until I realized money was not a foreign language or some other obscure academic exercise. And it was something I could not only understand, but teach to other women. Too many times I've heard stories from women who ought to know better but didn't, until they were forced to, because of divorce, widowhood, job loss, or the approach of retirement. This podcast will add another chapter to an ongoing informative conversation about financial topics women should be more knowledgeable about. My mission is to help women reduce their financial illiteracy and develop a healthy relationship with money. With that in mind, my guest today is Erin Wiseman. Erin is a life coach, podcaster, and fierce wellness advocate who helps inspire female physicians and working moms to do the work they love and absolutely love life. Her work in this world is to openly tell how she faced professional burnout early in her family medicine career so that no one feels alone. All know that change is possible because, quote, if she can do it, so can I, end quote, and that you have a joy-filled and sustainable career. She lives and practices life coaching and medicine in rural southwestern Indiana, loves her roles as farmer's wife, athlete, and mother of three, Besides being sassy, she enjoys getting mud on her shoes, teaching her children to catch tadpoles, and reading a great fantasy novel. 
Welcome, Erin. Thanks so much for having me, Lynn. I think this is going to be a lot of fun because not just because of who you are and your personality, but because I have five female clients who are physicians. And at some point in time along the way, they have reached this burnout phase, maybe not just once, but several times. And I can't wait to hear what you have to say about how they can get their lives in such a place that they can enjoy and love their life as well as their medical career. So I'm going to go back to something you you had on your website, which was that after all of what you've talked about, you say that medical system was designed for men with a full-time wife at home. Couldn't agree more. That's what I've seen so many times. And several other issues that you raise about how medicine was not really designed for women in their typical roles. So what I'm thinking is, in your case, what was the defining moment where you said, I've had enough? What happened to bring you to that point? Well, to be perfectly honest, it takes me several of those type of moments no matter what I'm doing in life, I guess I just have a really thick skull to get through my head to figure out not this, not this, Aaron. And so I think the pivotal one was back in 2014, after having many of these two by fours upside the head of of something wasn't (laughs) working out, maybe it's me, maybe I'm broken. Maybe, maybe it's just all in my head that I could do this. It was one night, particularly a Sunday evening, I was sitting on the edge of my bed, my two little boys at the time were out watching TV. I think it was Paw Patrol. And I remember just silently sobbing on the edge of my bed saying, why can't I be happy? Why can't I wow. look around in this moment and say, I've achieved all of my dreams because I had. I went to medical school. I did residency. I got my big girl job with the big paycheck and the new house and the minivan and the kids and the husband and the white picket fence. But in that moment, all I felt was just empty. And I know so many other women are like that too, where yeah. from a young age, as small girls, we are told you can do anything, go for it, girl. But what they forget to tell us is maybe we don't want it all. And that was a point of reckoning for me, was realizing even though I had done all the things, maybe I no longer wanted all the things. That must have been an incredible moment in your life. And so having recognized that, what was it that you did first? Besides silently sobbing (laughs) for a while. After the sobbing. I did what I tell all of my patients not to do, and which was God on the internet. And I was Googling, how do I change my CV to a resume? Because to be perfectly (laughs) honest, I'm the first physician in my family. I was looking Ah. around at everybody else. Um, I'm in a very rural area of Southern Indiana. And I thought, you know what? Maybe I just royally messed this up. Maybe I wasn't ever supposed to become a physician and dedicate all these years to my life and all of this loan debt. Maybe I just really, really misinterpreted what I was supposed to do in life. So let's try to change it. In addition to Googling, I got a hold of med school best friends, residency buddies, other colleagues, Shoot, I even was sending emails to my new employer, my boss at the time, my medical director, asking for a meeting to just sit down and talk to try to figure this out. And the worst part about it was everybody was either in two camps. One, hey, I feel the same way. I have no idea to do. Or two, I don't know what you should do. And those were the answers (laughs) that I kept getting. Like, I just need to keep my head down and keep pushing harder because I can't imagine my life being like this for the next 30 years. I cannot imagine what it's doing. And it's not like people were driving nails in my eyes or anything like that. But it was just the point that I had gotten to was I realized I had manifested a life that I wasn't even really a part of. I remember thinking way back when I was in medical school, well, a good doctor should wear X type of clothes, talk this type of way, show up all the time for all things for all people. And I really lost myself in the process. So what helped me was coming back to who I was, going back to the roots and figuring out where did my sass go? Where did my smart mouth go? 
where did the eclecticness that I had that I don't want to wear black pants and black shoes every single day. Where did Mm -hmm. that go? And why did that go away? And so that was a really interesting, interesting journey that I started traveling down. I remember going to the library and getting books. I mentioned in my bio, I love a great fantasy fiction novel. Oh, yeah. give me dragons and magic and girl wizards any day. I love it so much. <laughs> but at that point in my life, I hadn't stepped foot into a normal public library in probably over seven years. And so that was one seven? of the first things that I did was get back into reading again. Because if you remember, I mean, I was engrossed in medical education. Of course, I was in a library, but it was a medical library with texts yeah. and disease states and procedures and all of that sort of thing. So realizing that to be a good doctor, I needed to be me. And that was mm-hmm. that was it. And so in addition to that journey, I kind of stepped back. I'm a family med doctor. And I was like, you know, maybe I'm just depressed. Shoot, my office manager mentioned it to me that maybe I should start my own antidepressant medication. And of course, I looked at there and I was like, that's a bad idea. And I didn't do that. Thank goodness. But I also sat back and thought, well, maybe something's wrong with me. And in that process, I started really searching and seeing, okay, what can I do? Unfortunately, in the U.S., for a physician who seeks mental health services, many times it's punitive against their medical license. So being Mm -hmm. a young doctor with multiple six figures of debt, I was scared to death to even venture down that road, to even reach out for mental health support. So again, back on the Internet, I found a thing called life coaching. And I was like, you know what? If this is going to help, hashtag take my money. Let's do it. And I started an (laughs) online program for the first time and it was called the Entrepreneurial MD. I'm a DO by training, but I like to hang out with my MD buddies. And I thought, you know what? My family's full of entrepreneurs. Maybe I'll try it. And so that's what I did. And lo and behold, when I started working through those online modules, what I realized is I need to talk to this woman. And so I started doing one-on-one coaching. And that was where the real transformation started to happen in this whole process of getting back in touch of who I was. But then after you did that, did you make a decision that you were going to no longer practice medicine? You know, at that point, it was all about salvage. I was just trying to salvage out my career until I could figure out like what my next steps were. So yeah, at the time I was leaving medicine, if that meant that I needed to go work at the local Toyota plant, you know, screwing doors onto trucks, or if I Mm -hmm. was going to be in the checkout line at Rule King or the grocery store, I was more than willing to do that. Because at that point, I really was like, you know, this was a mess up. I totally messed up here when I chose medicine. Yeah, I was smart. Yeah, I enjoy part of this, but I can't hack it here. And so part of the process was just like salvaging, trying to figure out what I could do. And so one of that salvage tactics was, okay, I need to go from being full time to less time. And it took a lot of courage and a lot of bravery because remember at this point, I had literally just started the job and signed the three-year contract to go back in and renegotiate and say, "Um, actually, no, I'm not going to be able to do that. (laughs) But with the help of my coach um, who helped give me some clarity, some confidence and some courage, I was able to do that. And an amazing thing happened when I started to have white space, space that wasn't tagged up, wasn't double booked, triple booked. I started realizing that that woman who I used to be, who I thought was just gone, was actually still there and that I still had a creative spark. And through the coaching process, I started to look around and be like, you know what? My coach is in career. She doesn't even practice medicine anymore. Wouldn't it be great Mm -hmm. to have a physician life coach in the space who's young, whose kids are little, whose early career, who could help other women like me? navigate the isolation of burnout. And so that's what I did. I started taking those days to do coaches training, um, to take care of myself, to find other outlets in my life that I had totally put aside, just like the library, and realize, no, 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 those aren't frivolous things. Those are essential to who you are. Uh, yeah. And, and, uh, I, as I'm reading this, I'm I'm thinking, reading your bio and, and that information, it seems to me I'm getting the picture that now you are still practicing medicine or you've given it yeah. up. 
actually, yeah, I step, I stepped away from it for a couple of months and I realized there was still a doctor shaped hole in my heart that if I could practice medicine in the most authentic way that I am, if I could meet patients where I best operate, if, if I could show up in my best self, I love being a doctor. I call it third year medical student love. It's when you're so excited to go to work that you get up extra early. And I have that now. And I realize for me, that looks incredibly different than what I envisioned 10 years ago, five years ago, even. And that when I'm able to practice with that kind of alignment, it's not only just so fulfilling for myself, but also for my patients as well. So yeah, actually, I'm still practicing. Okay. I love it. Um, it's like you took a step back and said to yourself, this isn't working the way it is. What am, what can I do to make it all work? And I think you did. Uh, I'm fascinated by what you say is um, you're the farmer's wife. Does that mean you're actually out there in the fields too? When I don't have any other balls that I'm juggling, yeah, I do get out there and I help them as much as I can. Right now, um, it's the beginning of harvest season. It's always a really fun time because um, the seeds were put in the ground in, in the spring. They've been growing all year. And now we get to kind of reap the benefits. And my husband always talks about, you know, so many analogies that are related to agriculture in our life. But it's really true. We never really know those seeds that we're going to plant. How are they actually going to turn out in the end? And so that's why I love harvest so much, because you really do get to see the fruits of your labor and to see how things get to turn out. And so um, my husband and his father, they farm together. Our kids, they're to the point now that tractors don't excite them anymore. It's more of a punishment <laughs> to go have to hang out in the tractor cab with their dad or with their grandpa at this point. But I am really yeah. excited to raise them in uh, in this sort of life experience because it it is a dying breed to be perfectly honest. Yes. Yeah. And you talked before about planting seeds and watching them grow and not knowing what you're going to get at the other end. You've got three seeds there that look like um, they're, they're just good looking kids. And I'm assuming that they are probably uh, very adventurous like mom. I mean, in the sense of you, you do things that make you feel happy and joyous. And uh, I'm sure being at home, homeschooling at the moment is not their idea of a good time either. But somehow, I think being on a farm, you got a lot of opportunities to go out and do things that most kids living in inner cities can't do. Yeah, and I don't think that's it's something that they, they realize. It's so funny. They, they're all ready to have their own podcast. Um, which is really? for me <laughs> that they see that uh, that's something that they, they really want to do. And actually Yay. it's been several months back ago, but my oldest, he's a third grader. He just patted me on the back. It was kind of when um, COVID was first starting. He said, mom, I'm really glad that you're a happy mommy now. And you have to realize hmm. like my burnout hit when he was little, like toddler age. But at some point, I really feel like he probably knew that I wasn't a happy mommy, or at least yeah. he kind of rode the waves with me as I've made transition mm -hmm. after transition and pivot after pivot and tried things. Um, and so that's why I encourage so many women, like, don't wait, be a happy mommy now. You know, raising children is not an 18 year sentence that you just have to trudge through. And then at the end, you get to go have a happy life. Shouldn't we give our children the happiest version that we can now so that they, they can see, yeah. wow, like mom could do all these things. She does. She sees patients from our computer downstairs and she has this <laughs> podcast. And, you know, during the day, sometimes we go out and hang out with dad on the farm sort of thing. And so I just yeah. really encourage people to consider that to put their kids in the equation and not to wait and not to say, well, when they're bigger or when they're in college or when I get X amount of dollars in the bank, then I'll change, make a transition, um, do something different. It's like, no, do it now. So how do, how do people do that? What, what is your advice to them? The magic sauce, so to speak, secret sauce. What is it that, that women can do to make themselves be happy moms, happy wives, happy mm -hmm. people. The first thing I always do with anybody when I get on call with them is first hear them out. 
and and really try to get them to articulate into words what's the biggest struggle right now. And so many times everything just feels so big and so heavy and it just like just feels awful that we can't even articulate that. But being able to say like, no, this is my biggest struggle and get really, really granular with it. Get really into the roots of it. Because on the surface, so many times physicians come to me and they're like, oh, it's the EMRs or it's the administrators or it's the the big system of medicine. And I'm like, is it? Is it really? <laughs> And so digging down to like, no, really, what is your struggle? And I would say, and and this is where the work has to happen. Eight out of 10 women, when I ask them, is it? And they'll be like, "Mm, maybe it's not. Well, then what is it? And to keep digging in that and keep digging in that. I've waved my wand over you, sprinkled you with magic unicorn dust. Life is perfect. What does it look like? And for the majority of people, it's only about, 10 to 20% different than what they're doing now. Maybe it's being able to get up in the morning without an alarm clock blaring in your ear. Maybe it's being able to get your morning going without throwing pop tarts at people while you're throwing them in the car to get them to school. (laughs) Maybe it's having that just extra hour of time to move your body or meditate or go to mass in the morning or see a friend or read a book or sit out on your porch and just stare at the trees. And so it's amazing when I really have people sit down and say, like, what would the perfect life be? It always breaks my heart when people initially tell me, I don't even know. That's our first work is to figure out what that is. Because if you have no direction on what you really want, then we don't really have anything that we're working towards. And so then when we're able to imagine and dream, then that's where the work comes from. Okay, so now we kind of know where you want to go. So how can we make those shifts, both external and internal? Because my journey was when I first started this work, the criteria that I wanted in my life, I wanted to be able to work in my workout clothes or in jeans. I wanted to be able to get up in the morning without the alarm clock. And I wanted to have a life and a career that I wasn't always planning a vacation for. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question about what you said. If you could spread the magic fairy dust on somebody and they could have the life they want. I wonder how many times the life that they want is merely the absence of some of the stressors. And it's not necessarily a question that they can answer because they never have. So like you said, you went into medicine, you were going through medicine, medicine was what you thought you wanted to do. And all of a sudden you just said, "Uh uh-uh. On a, on a smaller scale, let's say you have somebody who is not very happy because they're kind of a sandwich generation. They're taking care of parents, caregivers. Um, they're also raising children, and they have a full-time career. It, if you ask that question, a lot of times you would find, well, I just wish I could give up the career or I could give up I get some somebody here for the caregivers or somebody. It's a way of just resolving the stress points in their life. But it's not necessarily saying this is the life that I want, assuming I didn't have to do any of that. So how do you get to the real source of the life that I want after you take care of the stressors? Well, I think that's a really good point. The first step is to delegate, is to remember you're not superwoman. You don't have to be the end all be all uh, keeper of the toilets, shopper of the groceries. Like you can delegate that and you should be delegating that. There are wonderful people in the world who will walk your dog for a few dollars and they get so much joy out of it. And yet your Mm -hmm. dog gets exercised, you get a break and they make a little bit of money. And so I think that's the first thing is what I help people do is to remove things off of their plate. What are things that must absolutely be done by you, which honestly is usually only just a small handful? And what are the things that are taking up a majority of your time that you need to delegate? 
And it's a really important when you get into this conversation is too many people get married to the idea of like, oh, only I can take care of mom and dad or only I can really provide the right type of love for my children or only I can buy the right type of Dawn dish soap for our home. And if you get into that, you really see that um, we make these invisible rules for ourselves that I have to do this. Why do you have to do this? Well, everybody thinks that, well, who's everybody? And so really Mm -hmm. getting into that and reminding yourself, like, do I? Kind of questioning the question. Do I have to do this? Am I the only one who can? And what happens if I let go of some of this control? Because what I find for many time in high achieving of women, we white knuckle grip so many things because of the fear of uncertainty and the loss of control. So we overcompensate and control in other areas of our lives when we really mm-hmm. need to get to the point and realize. Um, and I think COVID has been a very good reminder of this. We really don't have control over a lot of things if we step back and look at it. And the things yep. that we do have control over, are we doing our very best with that? We have control of how we move our body, what we put into our body, how we take care of ourselves and our loved ones. We don't have control over the economy. We don't have control over a virus that's spreading across the world. We don't have control over toilet paper prices. So let's really step back and just remember that. And the things that we can have control over, let's take care of them to the best of our ability. And sometimes that means us not doing everything and then reminding ourselves in the stuff we don't have control over that that's okay too. And not that you mm-hmm. just have to like roll with the punches and be like la di da kumbaya, because that is not how I operate. I'm very, <laughs> very, very much a control freak. But just reminding mm-hmm. myself in those moments that maybe I can't control this outcome, but I can control how I react to this outcome, how I am in, in the situation. So yes, I would say the first thing is getting those stressors off the plate, or at least identifying why those things are stressing you out and finding a high quality solution to bring those stress levels down, be that delegation or even just changing how we think about things. The yeah. next thing, as far as with the, the magic unicorn dust, with helping people move forward is really opening up that bandwidth to be creative, to imagine again. To get back in touch with that person that's way, 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 way deep down in there who she's still alive. There's little flickers of fire that are still happening for her. But how do we stoke those flames and bring her back? And many times that's me asking the question of what did you used to love to do? I meet so many women who say, I don't have hobbies. I don't have I don't I don't even know how to have fun. Well, that's one of my first things that I'd help them besides rest and delegation is learning to have fun again. It's so important in our lives. What does that look like if you're having fun? Well, what does it look like for you, Lynn? What is fun? Fun for me is doing a lot of things outside. I love to go outside and be outside. And that's why I'm living in a place right now next to a lake that's really quite spectacular. And just being out there is really fun. I love to watch all the animals and um, the birds, and all the fun things that are out there. It's very calming. And to me, that's fun. Mm -hmm. It's just like just living, just being. Yeah, being. (laughs) It's so funny. Hobbies, from what I learned, kind of the hidden curriculum of my life, always had to have some kind of productivity to it. You know, we were growing oodles of gallons of vegetables for which we passed out everywhere. Or somebody has a baby, so everybody makes quilts. Or maybe there's a bake fit sale happening. So, um, you know, baking and, and making dozens and dozens of cookies and brownies. But reminding yourself, like, if that's not fun, if it, it feels like you have to be productive, I think you can have fun and be productive. But if you've got to really look at, like, the intentionality of what you're doing, it is absolutely and totally okay to just do something for the pleasure of it and nothing else. If nothing else happens, I remember I couldn't like grasp the concept of sand gardens that Buddhist monks would create these beautiful, elaborate decorations with different colors of sand and and different etchings. And then they would just wipe it away. I was like, what? Are you kidding me? 
But mm-hmm. yeah, that is like the epitome of fun, like just doing something for the experience of doing it because it makes you happy in that moment. That's a good thing. Let's switch the conversation. I'd like to ask you a couple questions about your experience with money and what you remember sure. from your childhood. So what is your first memory around money? I remember money being somewhat of an elusive thing in our lives. Like we had money for groceries, but we didn't have money for dolls at the store. I remember asking my parents for money or asking my parents Mm -hmm. for things and and money being like, well, we don't have money for that or we don't need that. That's more of a want, Aaron. And so, Mm -hmm. so money for me was more of like a very like tricky character in my life. (laughs) So what were one, what was one of your first jobs and what did you do with the money that you made? Well, my parents didn't believe in allowances, but if we worked, then we would have money available for things that we wanted. But my first off the farm job was I was actually a tour guide in an historic town in Southern Indiana called New Harmony. And I would ride my Mm. bike to the historic town dress up in my costume and walk tourists around giving them a guide of the historic town of New Harmony. I later decided that I wasn't very good at memorization. And though I like butter, I didn't like to churn butter or make twine or other things. (laughs) So quickly, my next job that I did is I I actually got certified as a lifeguard and worked at the local pool. Oh, and that's where you got the athletic bent to your life? You were a swimmer? I was. And yeah, actually, it started much earlier. Um, I always loved being a country kid outside running and and playing and climbing trees. And and pretty early on, I would say like late elementary school, early middle school years, I realized I was faster than the boys when it came to races. (laughs) And I kind of like that. And so uh, that continued on through that. And so I ran track, I played volleyball. Um, I was even a girl wrestler before it was kind of a thing. But then my mom said, cute girls don't wrestle. And I kept that up. (laughs) So, (laughs) and of course, I'm in in Indiana. So basketball was a part of that as well. And later when I got into high school, they had a program for um, assisted athletic training. And so in addition to school and sports, I would go to um, other athletic games and kind of sit with the athletic trainer and learn all I could about the human body because I was already fascinated with it at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, What are some of the best and the worst financial decisions you've ever made? Mm, I can pin that into one thing. What I thought was the worst, but has turned out to be the best was actually medical school. In the Mm -hmm. middle of burnout, I thought that it was just the absolute worst financial mistake that I had made because at the time I had taken out a certain type of loan where if you worked in primary care, particularly in a rural area, you would get loan repayment. And so when I was in the middle of burnout, planning on leaving, I felt so trapped because I had promised I had wrote my name down on that piece of paper and promised that this was what I was going to do if they paid my loans back or if they had lended me the money to go to medical school. And so at the time, that just felt so awful. I felt like I had um, given up all of my integrity. But what I had to give myself was permission to change. That young 20-something, she didn't know what life was going to be like after marriage and kids and education and getting out into practice. She was just Mm -hmm. trying to make the best decisions that she could at the time. And so learning self-compassion and compassion for my past self, who she was trying to make the best decisions that she was, really helped me heal what I thought was the worst financial decision that I had possibly ever made. And now realizing that if I didn't have the degree, if I didn't have the experience of medical training and residency and practice, if I didn't have the ability to still practice medicine, perhaps that would have been the worst decision. So I'm actually really glad now that I made that decision. Who was or is the most influential woman in your life? And what advice did she give you? I would say it'd be my grandmother. So it'd be my paternal grandmother. 
she really stepped into my life as a figurehead um, as I was going through high school and college and, and trying to make these decisions. She's since um, started to develop some uh, memory type issues, um, personality changes. And so we're seeing some some early changes into dementia. And I still love her dearly. But I remember that feisty woman um, when I would call her after a medical exam or maybe the night before I was getting ready to take a test and just say, I can't do this. I wasn't cut out to, to do this. I'm not smart enough. I shouldn't be here. And I remember her telling me, Aaron, you were put in this place for a reason. You will be fine. You will go into that test. You will do your absolute best and you will leave with your head high. And I still remember her telling me this because that's what I would do after I had finished my exam. I would turn it in and I would walk out that door with my head held high, even though I want to just fall to the floor and just crumble to pieces and cry <laughs> right there. And I'll be damned yeah. every single time it turned out fine. Mm hmm. I was just going to say, that's, that's the classic advice. You just can't get it wrong. It may seem to be wrong at the time, like you, this whole thing you went through with your medical career. But as you just said, it turned out to be one of the best things you ever did because it gave you other life skills that you wouldn't have had. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last question. Do you see yourself being retired? No. I think I will I always think so. be doing some type of some type of work in some way bringing value into the world and being compensated for that. Maybe it'll be mm -hmm. me 70 years old selling mums on the side of the road. I don't know, but I I just don't know that I'll ever really really retire. I guess because now the life that I'm living, I'm doing the things that I saw my grandparents putting off to do, like traveling or yeah. Or meeting friends at noon or sleeping in till 10 a.m. So I've really kind yep. of incorporated the the like the retirement life already into my current working life. That sounds good. And I think more and more people when I ask that question, um, the answer is always no. I, I don't see myself retiring. And I think we think of it in a classic sense. We see it as someone reaching a certain arbitrary age and saying, okay, I've got enough money. I'm going to quit now. And then the first thing they do is throw out the alarm clock. And then they play golf and they visit their friends and they visit their grandchildren. And then they have no idea what to do with the rest of their lives because they never planned on their life. They planned on the money, but never on their life. And right. so I don't, I don't see you go, having gone through what you did ever saying to yourself, I'm done, because it's, it's constantly renewing. Yes, 100%. And I, I think generationally, um, so I'm a old millennial. Um, mm -hmm. I'm seeing more in our generation that are saying like, no, let's live life now. Let's yeah. let's not churn and burn and make the multiple six figures and like see how long we can do it until we fizzle out. Like, let's travel now. Let's live life now. Shoot, let's buy the hot tub now and use it yeah. now so that maybe it'll <laughs> save on my joints later and it'll sustain <laughs> me further in the future. That's I throw that in there because actually I think my hot tub is what's gotten me through COVID at this point as a stress reliever. But yeah, I okay. think... I think it's really recognizing that um, redefining success, that yeah. it's not a number in the bank, that it's not uh, the golden watch at the end of, of retirement, but that mm -hmm. maybe daily successes get to pile up and be our treasure at the end. Yeah. Well, my thanks to my guest, Aaron Wiseman. And Aaron, tell people how they can get in touch with you if they have additional questions or they'd like to take a course. Absolutely. So if you're listening to the podcast, you obviously love podcasts. So come hang out with me over at Dr. Me First. It's a podcast all about authentic conversations between female physicians, where we talk about everything life and practice. And I just put out there to my non-physician colleagues who are hanging out like doctors are people too. So we really are all going through the same struggles. Burnout is not a healthcare only issue. And so I am just mm -hmm. so passionate about helping other professional moms who are high achievers 
members who have done all the things and checked all the boxes and are just standing around in our bathrobes going, oh my God, I'm so exhausted. And so hang out with me there. The other place is with my new course. It's called Burnt Out to Badass because that's been my journey is going from incredibly crispy fried until and reigniting that inner burnout so that, that I inner badass that I am. And so now five years doing this work, I kind of have a way to help other people do it. And it's been so fun to walk that journey with other women and really help them get to the life and to the career that is just so filled with joy and sustainability that they can say, yeah, I'm kind of a badass now and I'm never going back. So come hang out with me. I love LinkedIn right now. It's a great place to be. So find me at Aaron Wiseman Dio on LinkedIn. And I'd love to have more conversations with you. Okay. So to all of you in my Power of the Purse community, I hope today's podcast was helpful in enriching your understanding of important financial matters and how some knowledge of money can go a long way to easing the burdens of life. Thanks again, Aaron Weisman, for sharing your time and knowledge. And until the next time, thanks for listening. And remember, money is not the enemy. Your ignorance of it is. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to The Power of the Purse with Lynn S. Evans, a certified financial planner. Be sure to subscribe for more inspiring stories and information to help you take charge of your financial future. For more information, visit powerofthepursepodcast.com. Hey there, I got some really important stuff to share with you. Besides developing Dr. Me First over the last, I don't know, I think it's like seven or eight years now, and Burnt Out to Badass, which is a little bit newer. It's been going on for about three to four years. I've actually been developing another business kind of on the side, and a lot of you folks are surprised when you hear about it. It's called Physician Coaching Alliance, and it does a lot of amazing things. First of all, if you're a chief wellness officer or you want to see more wellness in your organization, hospital, medical group, residency program, et cetera, Physician Coaching Alliance is your answer. We do consulting and coaching within organizations to bring better wellness into the healthcare space. So you need to go over to the website, physiciancoachingalliance.com, drop me an email with the organization, who I contact, who I talk to, and we can come in and help your institution. The other part of Physician Coaching Alliance is for those who are looking for a personal coach. Of course, I would love to be your coach, but I also know that I'm not everybody's well, taste and spicy sauce, let's put it that way. So there we have a menu of over 70 coaches who specialize in so many different things, who come from different parts of medicine. Some people are in medicine, some people are out of medicine, some people are hybrid. It's just a, an amazing group of an eclectic amount of skills and personalities. I'm sure you can find your next coach there. So again, same website, physiciancoachingalliance.com. And lastly, if you are a coach and you're tired of going in alone, maybe you're in a slump, maybe you just want to be around other physician coaches who are willing to give and are over the hustle culture and not about competing with each other, but knowing that how we heal healthcare is better together, then also Physician Coaching Alliance is the place for you. PCA fulfills so many of these needs and more. It's all on the same website, physiciancoachingalliance.com. You can hang out with us on LinkedIn and on Instagram by the exact same name, physiciancoachingalliance.com. Yep, I've been busy. <laughs> running multiple companies, practicing medicine, taking care of alpacas. But you know what? It is my heart and joy to do this. And I hope that PCA can become a part of your story too.